Since 1934, Iowa's farmers have turned to the Iowa Farm Bureau spokesman as their trusted news source. Now, the spokesman speaks. Listen in and hear from leading experts on topics important to farmers and agriculture. Now, here's your host, Lori Johns. Welcome to the Spokesman Speaks podcast. This is our January 28th edition, and we're so glad that you've joined us. Earlier this month, more than 100 Iowans traveled south to New Orleans to American Farm Bureau's 100th annual convention. Zach Bader, who is the producer of this podcast for Iowa Farm Bureau, was one of the attendees. Zach, down to Nolens. How did it go? Oh, it was amazing. Uh, You know, I'm impressed every year that I go down to that convention, just the impact that the Iowans who go down there, the impact that they have on that convention, whether it's the Young Farmer Awards or our policy work. Uh, We had 112 down there this year, and it's just always amazing to see the impact that they have. Isn't it? And you've seen it all evolve over the years because... Ladies and gentlemen listening, I was the one who hired Zach here at Farm Bureau 11 years ago, almost almost to this day. So, so Hard to can, believe it's been that long. So yeah. you can blame me. So that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> but welcome, Zach. I, I think that your enthusiasm is contagious, and they're really going to like to hear what you have to say, especially from your visit there in New Orleans. I always, I always say New Orleans. New Orleans. You know, it was a great trip. It was. Uh, there's the combination of what you learn. Uh, working with the Iowans who are, again, competing down there uh, and representing our organization. And then there's also the great national speakers that they bring in that you don't get exposure to every day. And so that was a good opportunity to talk with those folks afterwards and record those conversations and glad to bring those to our, our podcast listeners. Well, we can't wait to hear it. So that's great. Thanks, Zach. And we're going to hear more from Zach and the experts that he interviewed in just a bit. But first, we wanted to give you a rundown of all the Iowa highlights from American Farm Bureau's annual convention, including Iowa's successful policy work and some pretty impressive national recognition. For that, spokesman editor Dirk Steimel sat down with Iowa Farm Bureau President Craig Hill. Let's listen in. Over the years, Iowa delegates have been very successful at embedding policy developed through our grassroots policy process into AFBF policy. What were the key Iowa policies included in the National Farm Bureau policy this year, both at the AFBF policy session in December and the general session in New Orleans? Well, Dirk, you're right. And over the years, uh, I agree, Iowa's led the way on a number of policy issues. But most recently, uh, you know, I think our voice has been loud and clear on the Farm Bill. And the Farm Bill was signed into law on December 20th. Uh, We, as an organization, had supported, of course, crop insurance provisions there, but conservation and trade and a number of other areas. A big victory for Iowa farmers to get what we had proposed in a Farm Bill. But there's been some side conversations ongoing about the incentives around conservation. And some wanted to wrap that around crop insurance and maybe discount the premiums or the cost of crop insurance uh, to stimulate more conservation effort. And our members discussed that with a lot of education and effort. Uh, We kind of come to the conclusion that it creates a whole host of problems when you do that. Uh, The perils of Mother Nature and the perils of the marketplace, you know, are part of the actuarial soundness and, and the crop insurance premiums. Conservation efforts have to be unique to every farm, whether it's a cover crop or whether it's a buffer or grassed waterway. Every, every farm is a little unique in the needs they have to retain soil or improve water quality. But you can't combine the two. Uh, the, the interests of our membership and our farmers was that, that uh, we should keep those two things separate. And if there are cost share initiatives or, or incentives for conservation, that should be done but not uh, combined with our crop insurance premiums. Another thing, uh, you know, is the the crop condition reports. And those come from USDA. They're important to farmers. We want to maintain the current schedule. We have confidence in what USDA and National Ag Statistics Service is doing for us in the terms of those useful reports. But overwhelmingly, the biggest issue uh, I want to get to is protection of commonly known industry-recognized terms that we have in food and labeling. This is a very big issue. It's important to our members. And as you might imagine, we support accurate and truthful labels. And uh, labels that responsibly depict uh, what something is made from. 
So when attempts are made to simulate or uh, imitate uh, meat, milk, eggs, things that we grow here in Iowa, uh, just shouldn't be allowed to mislead consumers. Lab-produced protein is a product, plant-based or cell-cultured protein, produced protein from al algae, uh, but it shouldn't be allowed to call itself meat. So consumers have preferences and they have aversions to many things and uh, when new food products come, all, come around, uh, they should have their own reputation and not be stealing or uh, attempting to steal a reputation from a wholesome product like meat. So uh, that was the biggest issue and we developed a great deal of policy and instructions to USDA and the Food Safety Inspection Service as well as FDA, the Food and Drug Administration on what the framework of policy and regulation should be. The Iowa Farm Bureau also won several awards during the recent AFBF convention, including the Pinnacle Award for Overall Excellence and the New Horizon Award for our Innovative Health Care Plan. Why has Iowa Farm Bureau earned the Pinnacle Award five times in the past six years and won the Horizon Award this year? Why, Dirk? Because we're great. That's why. Well, we've been doing a great job and we, in terms of advocacy and the efforts we make there, in terms of providing member benefit, uh, something that we seek to do each and every day. In terms of engagement, uh, the engagement of our members, uh, the engagement of our staff, our leaders, uh, and the leadership that we show. Uh, we, we had excellent uh, marks in all the categories, and uh, when you do that and you make membership, as we did this year, you have the opportunity to be selected for a Pinnacle Award. And as you mentioned, uh, this year we got the Pinnacle Award, and it's been, uh, I think you said, five of the last six years that we've gotten the Pinnacle Award. So we're really tickled and pleased about that. The membership should be proud. Um, beyond that, uh, there was another award that we've gotten, uh, the New Horizons Award. And uh, as I you know, talked to farmers and, and people in Iowa, the biggest concern they had a year ago and two years ago was affordable health care. And how, as an individual, do I go to the marketplace and get something that is not only affordable but is a quality, uh, a fine quality? And uh, we developed a new product this past year, as you know, Dirk, and uh, we have our agents out in the field uh, making sales now and getting people signed up with enrollment. But uh, this has been a great, uh, uh, a great benefit that we provided our membership. And uh, for that reason, we received the New Horizon Award. Craig, a rural startup, Farmland Finder, won the top award in the AFBF Ag Innovation Challenge. It was the fourth win for an Iowa company in five years of the contest. What's that say about rural entrepreneurship in Iowa and efforts by Iowa Farm Bureau and others to promote rural entrepreneurship? Well, you know, ideas and technology and innovation um, and investment toward those new products is important to this state. It creates jobs. Uh, it creates opportunities for people. And it it helps farmers because we have new techniques and new ways of producing that makes us more efficient or makes us maybe better stewards of the environment or use fewer inputs. So all these new ideas need to be fostered in this state and uh, we do that at Iowa State University uh, with Ag Econ class that has students uh, from actually around the country come to Iowa to learn about entrepreneurship and they create a a new idea and a business plan around that. Each student gets the opportunity to do this. And you would be amazed at how many students and their ideas actually bear fruit and become a company. And here in Iowa, we have had uh, out of the last five years, I believe, in the competition, which there were 400 and some entries this year in this competition, we've won four out of those five years with an Iowa-based company. Uh, that came through Renew Rural Iowa, a program that we, uh, we house here at the Iowa Farm Bureau through the mentorship that we offer and, and the help that we provide these young entrepreneurs. So this is a, a fascinating thing that we do for our rural communities. And uh, gosh, you know, to think that nationally, uh, four out of five years, we've won this competition. And uh, those uh, like companies like Farmland Finder, uh, who knows uh, who will be the next John Deere, the next Sukup manufacturing. We don't know, 
but uh, we've got a bunch of companies being started that uh, may very well make that type of uh, uh, flagship uh, uh, reputation someday. What do you see as the key national legislative and regulatory issues that AFBF will focus on in 2019? Well, you know, we have a new Congress. And so I think, you know, we're going to have to start thinking about relationships and how we build a new relationship with a new Congress, how we interact and work with uh, the new elected officials or new elected representatives. So that's number one, I think, the number one focus. Uh, beyond that, um, labor, immigration, uh, border security. I think those issues are be issues that we monitor and we we're actively engaged in. Uh, regulatory reform. Uh, we've had some great success the past couple years in regulatory reform, and of course, WOTUS, the Waters of the U.S. initiative, uh, that rule has been set aside in most states, not all, but many states, and we've got a new WOTUS to, to escort through the process because I think it is favorable, this new rule, this new water rule. Uh, we want uh, clean water and we want clear rules, and I think this new WOTUS provision does that for us. So we'll be helping that as well as watching Fish and, and Wildlife Service in their efforts to uh, list potentially the monarch butterfly as an endangered species or listed species. So the efforts that we've made through the Monarch Consortium and other efforts help avoid this, hopefully. But, um, you know, beyond that, uh, you have to think about trade. Uh, that's a uh, very concerning place that we're in right now, and, and so we're watching, monitoring, and, and advocating for um, open borders and opportunities around the world in terms of trade. But infrastructure and broadband, broadband initiatives, getting everyone connected would be a big issue. Uh, waterways, uh, getting uh, the waterways opened, uh, maybe repaired, locks and dams, uh, and all those things. So just a lot of work to do. Uh, but uh, the American Farm Bureau is united in these goals, and the Iowa Farm Bureau has had a big role in getting our policy passed, and, and will have a big role in implementing uh, our new policy goals as well. So, a lot going on, both in 2018 and a lot will be going on in 2019, so you want to keep in touch. You know, every year Iowa raises the bar at the American Farm Bureau Annual Convention, and this year was certainly no exception. So much time and commitment and talent on display at the convention. Oh, we are all so proud of you, and I hope you know that too. Congratulations to everyone who went, everyone who participated, everyone who competed, and everyone who walked away with the trophy. I want to say thanks to everybody who represented us all so well in New Orleans. Earlier in the episode, we heard from Zach Bader, who attended the American Farm Bureau Convention, and he sat down with a couple of national experts who were giving presentations at the meeting. These folks are always on the go. And let me tell you, in fact, he, he had to grab one guy by the arm before he had to head off to the airport. So that's Eric Mittenthal, who is the vice president of public affairs with the North American Meat Institute. And, and he was part of a panel discussion on fake meat. And that's a pretty hot topic in agriculture these days. In fact, we just heard President Hill talk about Farm Bureau's policy efforts to make sure that those alternatives to meat, milk, and eggs are labeled as such. Zach spoke with Eric right after that fake meat panel discussion, and let's share that conversation right now. Listen in. joined by Eric Mittenthal here with the North American Meat Institute at the American Farm Bureau Annual Convention. Uh, Eric, can you tell me a little bit about the Institute, what your organization does? Sure. Our members are meat packers and processors. We produce 95% of the red meat in the U.S. and 70% of the turkey. And uh, everyone from your very biggest Tyson Smithfield Hormel down to very small Uncle Charlie's Sausage Company. We just got out of uh, a session where you talked about fake meat or alternative protein. Can you give us a little bit of a definition that you gave for the group in there about what, what is fake meat? Well, first of all, we try to try to avoid some of the, the, the words that are uh, maybe some of the more negative terms. Uh, certainly, there are folks out there who use the term clean meat, which we find inappropriate as well. And uh, I, I tend to refer to them as plant-based or cell-based products. Um, there are two different sets of products. So you have plant-based products that are specifically made from plants 
plants and then cell-based products that are made from animal cells that are then grown into a meat product. Um, they both kind of have common goals of disrupting meat production to an extent and selling in the meat case in competition with traditional meat products. How does that process work for creating cell, a cell-based product like that? Just in general, how do they make that happen? Sure. So they take cells from the animals and then those are grown. A lot of people describe it as lab, but, but at, at scale, it'll be, it'll be what's described as cultured, which is uh, almost done in the same way that beer is brewed, where it's brewed in a large vat and then uh, extracted from there as a finished product or as at least finished meat uh, cells to an extent that it can be combined into a product. And who are the primary players in the space at this point and, and what's helping drive, drive the creation of that product? Well, there are two main players in the cell-based space in the U.S. right now. One of those is Memphis Meats, and the other is a company called Just, which uh, many folks have heard in the past as Hampton Creek, and they're each creating their own uh, different product lines. Memphis Meats is interested in chicken, beef, and duck, and uh, Just is focused on chicken and uh, Wagyu beef, actually. Uh, And... They're, they're at different phases of their ability to bring it to market. Uh, Just claims that they're going to have something ready this year. Um, we'll, we'll see about that. Uh, may not be in the U.S. Uh, Memphis Meats says more 2021 timelines. So at this point, nobody has tried the products unless you're associated with one of the companies. Uh, and it'll be some time likely before anybody really gets exposed to them at a large scale. Why is this product even existing? Why are, why are people looking into this option of this cell cell-based product? They would say there's a variety of reasons. Um, they're, they're certainly looking for ways to come up with different ways of producing meat. Um, you know, they say that um, there are environmental uh, and health benefits to their production methods. I think we, we that's still yet to actually play out. We have to see when the products are actually on the marketplace, if there are truths behind some of the claims that are being made. Um, but they see themselves as a, as a different approach to making meat to, to feed people, um, just as we as an industry are aiming to feed people with traditional meat products. You mentioned that it's not quite on the market yet, but if it was to be brought to the market, just the cost of this from, from that perspective, is it is it at this point a viable uh, competitor to real meat or meat that comes from livestock? At this point, no. I mean, at this point, they're over $1,000 a pound for meat, which certainly nobody would, would pay that that price. Um, but but over time, they anticipate it's going to come down. Um, they certainly claim that they're going to reach a price point where it will be competitive with traditional meat products. But we'll see. It's something we'll have to, we'll have to see as the technology improves. So labels matter, of course, and what's what's being done to characterize these lab-grown and plant-based products in a way that's accurate? The labeling for the for the lab-grown products or cell-based products will determine on regulatory rules. And as they claim that they are meat products, we believe that they should be regulated as meat products. So that would mean USDA Food Safety Inspection Service regulation. And USDA requires pre-label approval. And so no products would go onto the marketplace without USDA actually reviewing and approving that label. And so uh, that is what happens with traditional meat products. And USDA is pretty strict about the types of claims that they will allow. So I think what we see on pa- those types of packages, if they're USDA regulated, will, will be accurate. Uh, for the plant-based products, FDA regulation is a little different. FDA doesn't enforce the um, label requirements nearly as much as USDA, which is where our concern has lied. And if you see some of the um, plant-based milks out there, that's an example of something that um, has kind of been been promoted in a way and, and packaged in a way that, that can be misleading to consumers about what's in the product. And I think we're seeing some of that in the plant-based meat space as well. From a labeling perspective, what kind of movement can we expect to see on that issue in maybe 12 months or, or, or looking out there and giving a little bit of a forecast? Well, the agencies are, are moving forward with regulatory requirements. And I think that that's probably the, the next big step is to see the agencies doing that really on, on both sides. So so I, th- I think, you know, FDA has been made aware of some of the concerns on the plant-based products, and hopefully we'll see maybe a little bit more focus on those from them. Uh, on the cell-based products, USDA and FDA have announced that they will jointly regulate those with a dividing line somewhere in the process. And so what we'll learn over the next year is kind of where that line is and and, and where the regulatory authority kind of comes in and, and switches between the two agencies. 
farmers who are listening to this podcast and see and read and hear more of this news about this alternative product out there as they see this competing in their space here, what can, what can farmers do? Farmers can tell their story. Uh, we produce amazing meat products in the U.S. Uh, they're, they're the best in the world, I can confidently say. And today's meat is nutritious, it's delicious, it's affordable, it's natural. And so we have a really great story to tell about our products. And so I would say tell the story about our products and how wonderful they are. And when you hear things that are inaccurate about our products, explain why those are inaccurate and and make sure that the truth is being shared about the products that we make and and the great meat products that the U.S. is making right now. He's right. Get out there. Share your story. We can help you do that. Because I tell you what, fake meat, uh, alternative protein, lab-grown protein, whatever you want to call it, it is an important emerging topic nationally. And it's one that we're going to continue to track for you in the months to come. You want to stay on top of this one. Sustainability is another topic that just continues to receive more and more attention. And, and you know, not just in the world of agriculture. Jack Scott, who is Nestle's Vice President of Sustainability and Responsible Sourcing, also participated in a panel discussion of sustainability at American Farm Bureau's annual convention. And, you know, the question, how does a global company like Nestle view sustainability? What does that mean? And what does that mean for farmers back here in Iowa and all those partners in their effort to reach all their sustainability goals that they set? Well, Zach caught up with Jack Scott, too, right after his panel discussion to ask those very questions and so much more. Check it out. Here with Jack Scott, who's the VP for Sustainability and Responsible Sourcing with Nestle. Jack, let's start out. You had a panel discussion the other day with a couple other folks talking about sustainability. So what does sustainability mean to a company like Nestle? Sustainability is not new to Nestle, right? Sustainability is something that Nestle has been endeavoring on for a very long period of time. And we would look at it from a variety of different ways across our entire supply chain. But more specifically as it relates to raw material sourcing and responsible sourcing of raw material ingredients, when we think about sustainability at Nestle, we're looking at it across a variety of different priority ingredients. So the way in which we might dress it when it relates to cocoa or the way in which it might address or relate to uh, coffee or maybe it's vanilla or something of that nature. There's always different challenges with those supply chains. And so for each of those supply chains, you have to take a look at them, go back to the origin and understand what are those biggest issues and how can you help to mitigate those risks and eliminate some of those issues with Indo supply chains. So for the United States, obviously animal agriculture, plant agriculture are very, very large in the United States. And we source a lot of those ingredients across our entire portfolio. So whether you're talking about dairy products or you're talking about food products for a food business or even a lot of the agricultural products that go into our pet foods, again, what we do is we look to see what are the biggest challenges that might exist within those supply chains and then we try to partner with, beginning with the farmers, different groups and different um, organizations that can help us to work with the farmers to bring some of those sustainability and responsible sourcing practices to the fields. Why is it a priority for Nestle at this point to put a priority on sustainability? That's an excellent question because today I don't think the dialogue around food and agriculture has been such a, a, a hot topic. And it's a very dynamic topic, and it's one that consumers are reacting to. It's one that um, the agricultural community is reacting to. It's one that you have a lot of external influences, whether it be small companies trying to create a competitive advantage, or maybe it's a civil society organization. Nestle is big to food, and, and, and it's, we're big to agriculture, just as agriculture is big to us. And for a company like us, the world's largest food company, we have an obligation to work directly with the agricultural supply streams and the food industry to find ways to assure that it remains healthy and viable for a long period of time. We're a company with a very, very long history, and we want to continue to have that long um, business long into the future. And so therefore, if we're going to be uh, sustainable long into the future, we have to look at our agricultural supply streams as a priority and ensure that those are thriving long into the future as well. 
So farmers provide the ingredients that go into a lot of your products, of course. And so what's Nestle's expectation on the farm side regarding sustainability? The expectations is it's always a challenging one, right? Because we do have a responsible sourcing standard and that is public and it shares our ambitions of what we're hoping the different agricultural communities across all of our supply chains are working towards. As it relates to agriculture here in the United States, sometimes what we find is that the easiest way for us to be able to have a progressive and and positive dialogue all the way through the supply chain from the consumers all the way to the individual farmers themselves is to focus on the foundations that allow us to have a long-term sustainable supply chain. These things include like um, healthy soils, clean and abundant water. We need rich biodiversity, both above ground in wildlife as well as in ground in the soils. We also want to make sure that the health and welfare of farm animals is cared for. And I know that these are things that farmers also are working towards, that things that they have achieved that has allowed them to be productive for so many years, but that they're wanting to continue to improve upon to be productive long into the future. So often when I think about what are our priorities, those are the biggest priorities that I think about when, as it relates to agriculture here in the United States. How does Nestle communicate its vision for sustainability to farmers, and what's the, also the feedback loop where farmers have an opportunity to communicate back to Nestle as well? So we've built a very strong relationship um, with the American Farm Bureau Federation. Um, we work closely with U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. Um, And we have open dialogues with other groups within the farming community. So it might be at the state level. And we also work with other groups like FFA and and have dialogues with them. So through those opportunities that we've built those relationships with those different farming communities, we get opportunities like the one that we have here today to come to their annual convention. And we have been a multi-year sponsor of the American Farm Bureau Foundation and the American Farm Bureau Federation Convention. And we get the opportunity to engage with farmers, engage with policymakers, to talk about the challenges that we're seeing, not just from the consumer perspective, but what our expectations are and what our ambitions are. And at the same time, hear from them what they're seeing out there and what their challenges are and what their motivations. But to be quite frank, the place where we have the richest dialogues is when we're working on a project basis with individual farmers in the field. We have five major projects out there today in agriculture, and each one of those engages multiple farmers. And when you go out and you visit with the farmers and you listen to how they talk about how they steward the resources and their lands and how they're motivated not just by what they're able to produce this season, but how to make sure that those lands stay healthy for the futures and of uh, in their family for their youth to take over the farm someday. That's great learning. That is stuff that is absolutely invaluable. And so I personally feel like the best conversations that I've had has been working directly with the farmers, hearing their concerns, their motivations, and at the same time being able to share what we're seeing on our side as well. What's the best way for farmers to get connected with you to be able to be in that feedback loop from a Nestle perspective? I don't know if there's a simple answer to that. Um, Certainly, we have a very strong relationship with the American Farm Bureau Federation. And so working up through the state federations, sharing with your representative, and allowing that to come back to um, the national level. We're also interested in building relationships with some of our key states where we do have operations. And so we're always open to having those dialogues. So Iowa is um, a key state for us. We have three manufacturing facilities in the state of Iowa. Uh, We uh, employ thousands of people. It is a very important state. We source a lot of agricultural ingredients for us. So having some of those conversations work up through the American Farm Bureau Federation, uh, through the state uh, farm bureaus, those are great ways for us to be able to get some of that feedback. Does Nestle receive any pressure or or feedback from outside groups that maybe want to pressure Nestle to pressure the farmers out there to change different practices? And how how do you go about dealing with that if you do receive that kind of feedback? Yes, so there is always external pressures. 
And external pressures for a company like Nestle and our size can come from many different groups and many different organizations. Some of them are very collaborative cons uh, conservation organizations. Some of them can be more activist, more extreme. But we listen to everybody, we hear everybody's thoughts, and we take those into consideration based on what it is that we're also wanting to achieve. Sometimes the conversations are very progressive and very positive, and there's even relationships already built within the supply chain back to the individual farmers. And it makes us very easy to work with the individual farmers using that feedback from external resources. Sometimes that feedback is much harsher, more critical, and can sometimes be directly um, linked towards an attack on our company's reputation, which can also cause financial pressure on our corporate organization and forces us to sometimes um, move in a direction that we recognize is important to these external groups may not always be the best option. And so some of the conversations that I've had directly with, for example, USFRA and American Farm Bureau Federation is that when those um, industry or those pressures from activist groups come to us, they're not often directed towards us. Right? We are a vehicle, but those things are often directed directly to the farming community as well. And it's important for the farming community to recognize that those sort of external pressures exist on food manufacturers like Nestle Purina um, and like Nestle and other big food companies as well. And therefore, it's important for them to have a voice and for them to express and share things that they're already doing on their farm today to move their farms towards a more sustainable future. As you look out over the landscape, looking at other companies out there, what's your gauge on how they view sustainability and, and how it's being implemented? Are you seeing similar things across the landscape or is, is Nestle pretty unique in that, in that regard? That's a great question. I'm not gonna mention any companies by name, but certainly there are some other great food companies that are out there doing very, very similar work as to Nestle and Nestle Purina. Um, groups that are, are food companies that have dialogues directly with the farmers, that have programs, and by and large, especially for a lot of those larger food manufacturing companies, we have very, very similar values. We feel the same pressures, we see the same market pressures, the same external pressures. We see the same opportunities that lie ahead, the new technologies, the new innovations. And so in a lot of ways, um, we do have open dialogues and, and exchanges of information to talk about, you know, what can we do to work together to move things forward in, in a positive direction. Not all food companies, though, are at the table. And I have to just point that out. There are a lot of food companies that are still flying under the radar, so to speak, right? They're not necessarily getting engaged. They're taking this opportunity to allow the spotlight to be on some larger companies while they do things in their own way. What I have to say is that personally, I have some very good relationships with some of these large food manufacturing companies directly with those individuals. And so we don't allow that noise to disrupt us from what we're trying to achieve. And we do focus on trying to work directly with the farmers and the agricultural communities to understand and support the efforts that they're putting in to their lands. Any final thoughts for, again, we're talking to a group of farmers that are listening to this on the podcast in Iowa. Any final thoughts that you'd like to share with them? One of the things that I'd love to be able to share is just to say that um, as we think about the future for Nestle and Nestle Purina. Our future is rooted in the long-term productivity of the farmers and the producers. Another way to say this is that our ability to be successful in the long term begins with the farmers and the producers ability to also be successful in the long term. And those short-term decisions that the farmers have to make every season, recognizing the long-term impacts that they have we want to be part of those conversations to help invest in those opportunities to bring long-term sustainability practices to the field so that the farmer doesn't necessarily have to shoulder the responsibility of all of those themselves. And as we can create a more thriving agricultural community through work that we do directly with them, and they then in return can help us be successful in the long term, I see that as creating shared value for both us and for the farmers.
So they have multiple manufacturing plants in Iowa, and they work with ag and non-ag stakeholders. And we'll probably no doubt be hearing more from them in the months to come. Isn't it encouraging, though, to hear the admiration that others have for farmers and the work that you're doing to protect the environment and care for your animals, especially when that praise comes from someone speaking on behalf of a global brand like Nestle? Sharing the story of ag is a challenge. Yes, we all know that. But it's helpful to know that we do have partners. We're not alone. We have partners to help spread the word. Well, that's all for this episode of The Spokesman Speaks. We hope you'll join us for the next episode of our podcast on February 11th. Until then, thanks for reading The Spokesman. Thanks for all the great stories and the inspiration. And thanks for listening to The Spokesman Speaks. I'm Lori Johns. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcasts and articles from The Spokesman at iowafarmbureau.com slash spokesman. You can also find and subscribe to The Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Play, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews and welcome your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.